Welcome to the first annual National Psychedelic Policy Roundtable. Today, you will be hearing from industry leaders, policymakers, and from PMC's Community Grants Program awardees. We will cover topics that range from the war on drugs, psychedelic research in the FDA clinical trial process, barriers and challenges within our current government structures, and some serious issues the movement is facing with healing at a community level. We appreciate your time and attention as we reveal the current landscape of psychedelics. In 2021, PMC created the Plant Medicine Foundation to build and educate the psychedelic community starting in Washington, D.C. We awarded several grants to community members in the D.C. area that are working on harm reduction, integration of psychedelic experiences, psychedelic advocacy, and education. We welcome Roman Hafford, PMC's Director of Community Engagement, for an interview with grant awardee Sadaf Lutfalian to dive into how PMC is supporting community efforts around safety and psychedelics. Hi. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, we are here in um, virtual space um, for the Psychedelic Medicine Coalition's very first National Psychedelic Roundtable. And I'm my name is Roman Hayford. I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement. Um, and I'm here with Sadaf Latfalian, PhD. Um, who uh, we're all smiles because um, Sadaf is someone who I know very well and, and appreciate very much. Um, and we're gonna get to spend some time with you talking about how you sort of decided to take advantage of our community grants program in order to really further some work that you were being asked to do in the community, some innovative work mm -hmm. actually as a clinician, mm -hmm. but also as a psychedelic therapist and also as mm -hmm. someone interested really in um, addressing different types of harm, um, mm -hmm. you know, harm, interpersonal harm, harm done by practitioners, toxic masculinity, um, these mm -hmm. issues that are coming up so much in our community. And I just love um, speaking with you today, Sadaf, as a clinician, um, you can give some really grounded um, insight into what's going well, um, what's been difficult, um, and I just can't wait to share your story in this forum with, with our listeners. So let me turn it over to you to say a little bit more about who you are, your practice, your background and training a little bit, and kind of how you came into this grant. If you sure. Would. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I feel really privileged for that this is also the first uh, sort of round table. So thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks for your trust. Um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, um, working in private practice, but also teaching on the side and sort of traveling internationally for retreats and so on. Um, and many, many years ago, I happened to be lucky enough to be an intern at Johns Hopkins, um, on one of the sort of the psilocybin trials. Um, and then decided to go for my PhD in clinical psychology so that I could sort of do that on my own one day, um, not entirely, but just like as a part of the path. And, um, and now I'm licensed and uh, sort of delving into this work a bit more freely and exploring what that means for me. But um, what I noticed along the way, and I think part of it was I just trusted what was happening. I actually didn't have in, I, if you had asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have known that I would be here within the psychedelic community. But, but what happened was that I think um, what I was observing and what people were coming to me for was that they were explaining how some of these psychedelic um, settings and facilitators and so on um, were actually kind of harmful for them um, on many different types of levels, like physical, psychological, sexual, emotional, spiritual. Um, and so I started gathering a lot of stories around how much harm was actually being done in the community um, until I was sort of um, really a bit more directly 
asked to participate to sort of do a clinical assessment of whether this was harm that was done in this particular case? And if so, how do we actually want to approach this? Because as you know, the sort of um, psychedelics are now everywhere in North America. Things are, of course, moving uh, on pretty quickly. And so if we're not mindful enough about how we're approaching the medicine and also these communities, I think it can really quickly get it, get out of hand. So, so I'm at that place where, where I was like, okay, I need, I need to sit with these people who are coming to me who have actually been harmed in these spaces. And a lot of times they don't actually, you know, um, financially, it's not always feasible for them to pay to hire a consultant or hire someone to like help them. So I was a bit, I was feeling a bit overstretched and feeling like there's a lot of demand and um, not a lot of people that I know that are in my position um, who, who I can collaborate with. So it, I, you know, I was just starting to feel a bit like I don't have a lot of resources to to do this, you know, and I that and time and money and energy and all of that was feeling a bit um, hard. And then I was, of course, I heard about um, the Psychedelic Medicine Coalition and the amazing work that, you know, that you are all doing and how there was this grant opportunity. And what was strange was that I, I don't think I could fully own how important this work was. And when I would start sharing in little ways of like, should I apply for this grant? Like, is this justified? Is what I'm doing really, what is this? What am I doing? And the reflection and the mirroring that was happening in the community was like, oh yeah, and here's my story, please apply. You know, like we need this. And then with community leaders being like, this is amazing. Of course, this is important. So just apply. So I, I and you know, with your guidance to so it felt like, okay, I actually, this is important and I, and I can own that and um, I can be of service in this way and I'm going to put together a grant. And I almost feel a bit like, wow, I, it happened and I got the grant and, and how do I want to use it? And I feel really, um, it just, for now, it feels like, wow, I think this is a reflection of how much we need this um, in the psych psychedelic community. And and the mirroring that happens is that everybody voices that this is important. And so I'm, I'm just really thankful that you guys see that and are helping me um, sort of do that. I'm using, honestly, I'm using the grant money to apply, to sort of apply it to my time to do consultations with victims of harm in psychedelic spaces and create sort of proposals for them to see how we can apply restorative justice with some of your expertise and whenever I can um, bring people in to put together a plan of just creating more healing spaces and also sorry I'm talking for so long now but also to put together trainings and like teaching opportunities to go to psychedelic spaces and maybe even inform leaders facilitators practitioners um, both inform them but also sort of be a, the catalyst for for sort of these conversations of like this is important and we all need to sort of pause and slow down and understand as facilitators or leaders like where where is our privilege and what are our blind spots and what guidelines you know are we really following what ethical codes are we following just pause you know and slow down and encourage them to also slow down a little bit because i think we're going a little bit too fast Oh, I have so many questions for you. I, I would love to sort of s set the set and setting, as it were, <laughs> uh -huh. to perhaps use that term uh, a sure. little loosely, but for our listeners to really kind of from, let's drop into, you know, what, I know you've had a couple of different opportunities come along to practice this, but I'd love to walk through a little bit what kind of harm are we talking about who are the mm -hmm. people that you have been approached by and feel personally called to serve and perhaps use this first case that you were working on mm -hmm. when you got the grant as an example respecting confidences and ethical standards of course mm -hmm. um because i think that's really important you know we're talking mm -hmm. about 
I'll let you say it, but you know, we're talking about you know, women and women of color in these mm -hmm. somewhat less formal spaces. And I've really appreciated how, you know, both you and I, we celebrate the various cultural spaces, of course, in which psychedelic therapy or, or psychedelic sessions, assisted sessions mm -hmm. have risen up. That's something we celebrate. And there's particular types of risks involved with any setting, be it clinical mm -hmm. or not. So maybe if you want to talk about those different vectors of harm and really what we're talking about here and what what's been yeah. coming up more and more and and how you personally connect to that what's important about that to you yeah mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah so uh, okay so maybe let me put it this way um there are different types of harm and and I feel like at this point, I've heard about all of all types of harm in the psychedelic community, whether it's physical, where either a participant or a co-facilitator or a guide or a person who's merely just sort of um, housekeeping, you know, all, all the people in different roles have been physically or sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. um, or whether it has been emotional in the form of gaslighting or mockery or turning something into um, sort of uh, entertainment rather than actually doing deep psychological work. Um, so it's been emotional where it's there's a lot of sort of no, you are crazy type of talk. Like you are wrong, you are crazy for feeling this way. This in a psychedelic world, there's a lot of language around um you haven't done enough work mm -hmm. so you're 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 crazy for thinking this way you haven't gone deep enough you know so like go deeper take a higher dose you know like take a higher dose or you should go deeper than this it's because you haven't you haven't had an ego death big enough to like then approach this transcendence maybe it's because you're weak maybe it's because you're fearful that kind of language a, a bit of you know um making someone not trust their own process essentially and um their own pace um some of it is that some of it is uh, that the, this is also huge what i'm hearing a, a lot of times is um having one belief system and one truth about existence about the world about the cosmos about everything and then with a sense of grandiosity, almost saying as if that's the truth. And you see that in a lot of facilitators. No, it works this way. You know, this is how it all works out. Uh, and that kind of language, I think ethical practitioners are usually humble enough to understand that life is actually quite nuanced. And who am I to say what, really? And I think I really value that kind of humility. Um, in, in saying, uh, you know, like, you know, what you're needing and what you need to do and, and all of that. So these absolute truths and these like big beliefs around how everything works, I think that usually for me is also a red flag, you know, and also a bit what I'm seeing is also what I call unearned intimacy. Uh, and yeah. where all of a sudden you see in psychedelic communities where like people are just like, there's a lot of intimacy all of a sudden and you can tell you know a lot of my clients when they approach me they usually say hey i don't i don't want you to be if you're one of those like clinicians that's like all love and all hugs and i love you right away like i actually don't want that and i'm not like that and sometimes i think there's a bit of unearned intimacy that goes on in psychedelic communities where we sort of all of a sudden become all love uh, pretty quickly and usually what happens is that the facilitator gets intimate pretty quickly without earning uh, intimacy um, or without even being justified sometimes it's like i don't know there's no place for actual intimacy between a facilitator and the participant you know or what we see is between two facilitators where they're in vulnerable places they are dealing with a lot of things they're dealing with the medicine and all of a sudden they get into intimate spaces and it's actually quite unearned. Um, we can go deeper into that, but what I think that though that term recently for me, it's like, 
I think intimacy needs to be earned. And I think we're pushing for a narrative of vulnerability right now. Everybody's on this vulnerability sort of train. No, Biba, and I think that's fantastic coming from toxic masculinity where like, you know, everyone's like, you know, to like, ah, now everybody's vulnerable and like, let's all be intimate. Um, I think just mindful of like, no, I think it, it needs to be earned still. Um, and what is that like? How do you actually build rapport and trust with a facilitator or with a co-facilitator and earn intimacy versus just sort of fall into it because psychedelics are just like love bombs, you know? <laughs> so does that make sense? That um, I, I that? love that. I really love that terminology. And, I, and I'm, you know, one quick follow-up I would have is in your perhaps in this case with the grant or in any others are there any tools that you provided because you're essentially providing some facilitated therapy and some facilitated consultation to assist to, to educate and assist you know and support folks who or community or community where these issues like a pattern of unearned intimacy that hasn't mm -hmm. been named, you know, mm -hmm. what are, what are just, if you could just name like a couple of offerings that you've been able to provide um, mm -hmm. or that you've noticed that you would make, whether from an ethical standpoint, whether from referring, uh, making re referrals of, okay, this mm -hmm. community needs that based on my training. Could you give us some examples of, of what you've been mm. able to identify and and offer yeah for things like that or what you're working with around that yeah um honestly i don't i don't i don't know if there are like particular interventions but it it, it to me the thing that sticks out is that most of us need a lot of boundary training mm. most of us like most people, what, what from what I'm experiencing, I don't know about you know everybody's experience, but from my experiences, both in a, on a personal level, but also in professional communities, we keep coming to the same um, area of a lot of trauma-informed care and a lot of trauma work, um, and a lot of unearned intimacy. Usually comes because we we haven't learned boundaries and we we're not in a culture because we're to some degree in a normalized culture of aggression and violence. And, you know, all of that is constantly being projected onto, especially onto vulnerable populations, but onto pretty much everybody. Um, it, it's almost like we, we all need basic levels of sort of education and foundation about what boundaries are. How do you actually clarify them for yourself? How do you ground yourself in them? How do you communicate them? What are emotions? Like, how do you identify your emotions? And a lot of times that work is what will then determine what boundary you need to sort of communicate in that moment. I am angry. This is anger. And I know that anger is then this boundary. So why don't you stand over there? You know, that kind of the more you get to know that, oh, I know anger. I know what anger needs. So anger needs this or I know what what sadness is it need, i know what vulnerability feels like it's this and this is the boundary you know so a lot of them i don't know if they're perfect but it's sort of like can we start from the beginning and have some foundational requirements for facilitators and for participants to one get really good at identifying their emotions and also then clarifying their boundaries and and then helping each other supporting each in each other and saying i support that you know, how do I, you know, thank you for taking care of yourself kind of language. Where do you hope this goes? You know, now that you've had some support, been able to practice a little bit, where do you see this going? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to do more of? Yeah. And you know, you want to serve in doing that. Yeah. yeah um, I really don't get paid for saying this. So I, I just want to say that, I'm, you know, this is just coming from my, my, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, but I'm, I haven't been in the field and you know that there's a lot of money in the psychedelic world right now. 
and we may be in the process of repeating capitalistic for profit da 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 patriarchal all of those um sort of models the medical model and the harm in that and who are we actually serving you know all of that mess and the amount of money and support that 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 sort of model has right they have there's a lot of there's a lot of money in in um people who want to just push the medicine forward and i do too but it's it's humbling and it creates trust for me to then know of coalitions associations organizations like the psychedelic coalition um you know all, I, I guess let me back up because I don't want to be black and white about it. I feel what feels hopeless sometimes is that there's a lot of money in places where I feel our motivation is not in the right place. And so sometimes it can feel like my work around like creating safety is probably not going to get a lot of attention and there isn't a lot of money in it. I mean, who, you know, and I don't know what kind of kinds of supports I would have and what kinds of grants would be available for, for me, because I don't necessarily, I'm not pushing the money agenda forward. You know, in fact, I'm telling us to really slow down and let's not, let's not do this. Let's just pause for a moment. Um, so it is hopeful where, when sort of associations and organizations are supportive of these of these movements, you know, of these sort of for now micro movements um, that are promoting a pause, that are promoting data collection about just the process, you know, that are promoting um, sort of understanding what safety is from a very diverse perspective and not just like a, from a very specific population who has a lot of power and is now has a lot of interest. Um, so what feels hopeful is their openings to give us micro movement people some attention and, and value and saying, um, let's, let's do this. Um, but to be honest, um, there aren't that many and, and we need more money essentially and we also need more attention for more facilitators i feel like a lot of the facilitators are in this anxiety sort of space of like i better get my name out there i better you know have a foot in the field i better not be left behind in this like super quick movement that's happening and that anxiety is making it so that we're just sort of bypassing these micro steps that are super important and so the more organizations and associations and people and practitioners and participants pause to say, no, actually, can we, can we also focus on this and put, you know, invest in this with our energies? Um, that I feel more hopeful with, even now, more than a year ago. Because then a year ago, I felt like an island. I felt like I didn't even know you know, um, it was just very qualitative. And now there are movements towards a bit of a more quantitative sort of approach, some more data, more associations getting involved, and hopefully more grants sort of coming out of it. Us sitting here is, is a testament to the hope that, again, here in this work, we can do better. And perhaps yeah. even par particularly in this work. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Well, I do, um, you know, not to be that person, but I, just thinking of the character of psilocybin, you know, like if we just personify sort of psilocybin for a moment. Yeah, I'm going. Um, <laughs> but for me, it just feels like if we learn one thing is like slow down and move with compassion and move with connection um and you, you don't have to initiate from a place of fear um there are all these lessons where you actually sort of 
trying to see what are our lessons from the actual medicine. Sometimes it's funny because I think we're talking about the medicine so much, but it's such a human process now that we almost forget that the medicine actually has its speaking, but we're not speaking the language of the mushrooms, you know? Do you know what I mean? We're almost like making it really human at this point too and like forgetting <laughs> that the magic is actually in the mushroom not in what we're doing a lot of the time so um i'm also sitting with like what's the lesson that mushroom gives us but it's like this sensation of it's okay like pause and what is love you know loving from a place of non-attachment what is connection where you feel energized because you're in touch with nature and love and universal compassion and all of that it rarely is ever like am i a good enough facilitator and should i be like moving up my da 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 in my community or like should i be making more money because money you know it's rarely about those things um it does that relate to what you were saying i think i had a moment where i was like what would what would yeah, mushroom say i got pretty you know, I, I, I denatured my, my, my language mind there for a minute and was, <laughs> and it was just, I was, you, know, you, you took me to a place where I was like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like talking about the ocean versus being in yeah. the, versus being yeah. in the waves. Oh, you know? I love that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So sad do you, do you remember actually the name of, of, of your, your grant proposal? and and what you what you propose to do for for the pmc grant yes so the actual title was reclaiming safe psychedelic spaces mm -hmm. and um the grant was around essentially for me to use the money to sit with people who approach us who have uh, been harmed either as a as a co-facilitator or as a participant in psychedelic spaces that are needing psychological services they need um sometimes it can be crisis management but they need psychological services they need an assessment of harm they need support of therapy and they're uh they're also or i should say or or and they're uh looking for a restorative process to bring sort of um healing into that dynamic and create awareness in that for the larger community because they don't want the harm to keep going. Awesome. Yeah. So, so important. So, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We are so honored to support our 2021 community grants program. You can find a complete list of Plant Medicine Foundation grant awardees on our website, psychedelicmedicinecoalition.org. We cannot discuss psychedelic policy without considering the damage the failed war on drugs has caused many Americans. That is why we are so honored to have the one and only Leonard Picard with us. Leonard's fascinating life story and eventual 20 years of incarceration in a federal prison is an example of how flawed our policies on drugs are. I had the pleasure of meeting Leonard last year, and it's with gr gratitude that we welcome him to our first PMC event. Leonard Picard is a graduate of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and holds degrees in public policy and chemistry. He was a research associate in neurobiology at Harvard Medical School and was given a fellowship in drug policy at Harvard's Interfaculty Initiative on Drugs and Addictions, a part of the Mind, Brain, and Behavior Program. He was also deputy director of the Drug Policy Research Program in, at UCLA. Leonard was arrested in 2000 for what the DEA alleges is their largest LSD lab seizure ever. He was sentenced to two life terms in maximum security federal prison, but was released due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the softening of sentences for drug crimes through the First Step Act. Welcome, Leonard. Hi, Melissa. Lovely to see you again. First of all, how are you doing? How are you adjusting to life after prison? Well, each month seems to be a growth experience. Um, I'm still uh, familiarizing myself with the, uh, the technical aspects of worldwide communication and Zooming and all that. 
but uh, yeah. it's an exhilarating time, meeting lots yeah. of uh, new and old friends and being warmly received. It's yeah. joyous, frankly. Yes. And what was it like to step back into what's seemingly the psychedelic renaissance? Oh my, you know, I was completely unaware, effectively unaware of the magnitude of events um, while incarcerated. We had uh, an occasional New York Times and I would hear of uh, this matter or that, but had no idea of the breadth of three, 400, 500 uh, corporations worldwide, um, the clinical trials, um, the um, extreme interest and um, the softening by regulatory agencies, FDA, DEA, DOJ, um, uh, to some extent. Um, it's a time of great hope. Um, I frankly never saw, I thought I'd live to see it in my lifetime. Wow. So I mentioned the First Step Act. What role did the First Step Act have in your release? And what do you think are the next achievable steps for criminal justice reform as it relates to psychedelics or just drug reform in general? Well, the First Step Act was um, absolutely uh, a miracle in uh, my life and the life of many others. Uh, it occurred in the uh, last few days of the congressional session. <clears throat> and uh, if it had been uh, delayed, it would have been put off for years, perhaps never come back around again. But there was a perfect storm of um, bipartisan interest, uh, oddly during the Trump administration, um, in which uh, it passed. And the difference it made in prisoners' lives was that before the First Step Act, uh, once one was convicted, one had only the appellate process uh, effectively. Um, and that's an enormous uh, cliff face to climb. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to have a uh, uh, appellate court reverse one's case. Um, cases become entrenched and um, the decisions are considered final. But with the First Step Act, uh, Congress for the first time allowed uh, prisoners to petition directly to the sentencing judge, write a motion to the court, um, uh, pleading why they should be released. Um, uh, generally, these are on extreme medical grounds, mm -hmm. um, but many other reasons have been uh, proposed and some have been granted. Uh, I've seen prisoners' uh, petitions ranging from heartbreaking, uh, handwritten, uh, poorly composed, barely literate uh, pleadings to a judge that go on for page after page after page to uh, remarkably refined uh, motions composed by <clears throat> million dollar big law firms in DC. And there's no real uh, way to tell which one will work its magic in the judge's chambers. The man in the black robe that has the absolute power with a stroke of a pen uh, to release an individual. Uh, I remain, without naming my jurist, I remain eternally grateful for the mercy shown to me. Yeah, you can now have a second chance. So that's amazing. It's, it's amazing what bipartisanship can actually achieve in D.C., um, those moments when both parties put their dogmas aside and see the need for a greater good. Um, it can truly be life-changing, and we definitely see that no, in absolutely our life changing. Well. Uh, prison is a, a gravely humbling experience. Uh, uh, one learns um, a great deal about oneself and others. One sees a um, uh, type of nobility even among the extremely dispossessed uh, and their endurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course. Uh, Is that what you learned? Is it, what, what kind of lessons did you learn about yourself and life while you were in prison? Well, that's a very deep question, uh, Melissa. I'll, uh, I'll try to answer that. I, um, I learned that, well, to put it succinctly, I learned that uh, 
friends and family, one's loved ones are the only thing that survives uh, the winds of change. If, mm -hmm. if indeed they do, many men lose their families immediately. Others take a few years or 10 years or uh, I've seen families stay together through life sentences. One woman would come to a visiting room for 17 years, <clears throat> moved to the city in which her husband was housed and never left him. Wow. Others would divorce uh, immediately after an indictment. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's love itself, which is most meaningful. Mm -hmm. And when all is stripped away, one's job, one's position, one's um, finances, one's possessions, one's dignity. The only thing that remains, if they do remain, are one's loved ones. And yeah. so one learns that after many, many grueling years, when things become truly hopeless, there is that shining light that one works toward that makes one go into the law library and write motion after motion after motion and study law endlessly and become increasingly isolated and far away and forgotten. Uh, but there is that little light. Mm -hmm. And so that's what drives most men forward. And I was privileged, yeah. privileged to have a light that kept me going forward. Yeah. That's beautiful. So while you were in prison, you compiled information on the DEA's narcotics and dangerous drugs information system, NATUS, arguing that it erodes civil liberties by collecting chronological information on individuals with no criminal history, including sports figures, celebrities, politicians, attorneys, and researchers. You've been, you've been an instrumental figure in uncovering aspects of Natus's program, especially um, via Freedom of Information Act requests regarding your case. But the vast majority of the program remains in the dark, and I'd even argue most people don't even know this exists. We have seen some public outrage about government surveillance in the recent past with the Patriot Act, but what action should be taken to make the public aware of this database and any threat it poses to constitutional liberties? Well, federal agencies' databases are, um, have been routinely implemented since each agency began. Um, for DEA, there would be NATIS, uh, but for uh, FBI, that would be their, uh, currently their, their Sentinel system. Um, each agency, even ATF, has a different database. And uh, I can speak a little to NATIS uh, on DEA's part. I um, uh, required the NATIS records of, of the individual whose testimony put me away. I thought there might be interesting aspects of his background that would be uh, uh, helpful in the appellate process. Um, so I, I filed a, uh, began to study NATIS and filed a Freedom of Information Act uh, request on, uh, on NATIS systems. And I uh, got the first NATIS um, record actually after a number of years of appeals back and forth with DOJ, got the first NATIS record on a deceased individual, uh, LSD chemist Ron Stark. Um, from that point forward, began to, to look at NATIS very carefully and, and wrote a short paper on it. Um, at the time I looked, uh, NATIS had about 8 million records on uh, U.S. citizens and uh, citizens uh, abroad, uh, including about a third of the uh, Colombian National Congress. Um, people of interest around the world that are alleged by uh, people in during DEA interviews to be involved in trafficking. And so a uh, DEA six, as it's called, is written on the individual. A little summary of this is put into NATIS so that uh, a DEA agent can scroll through uh, the NATIS uh, records and, and pick out uh, uh, topics of, of uh, concern and interest. Um, Agreed, it, many may consider it an invasive, but then again, NATIS can be used to, uh, and has been used 
uh, to identify um, um, major heroin trafficking rings in Afghanistan supporting terrorist attacks throughout the world. So that is a uh, reasonably positive use of NATUS uh, for the public safety. And it can also be used mm -hmm. to um, locate a refiner as an investigative tool to uh, shut down uh, major fentanyl labs in Mexico or China, uh, resulting in 100,000 deaths uh, annually. Uh, so while NATUS uh, does have its aspects of abuse, and there have been incidents of abuse of NATUS and individuals using NATUS. Um, it's not entirely negative. It can be helpful to mm -hmm. uh, reduce the uh, number of fatalities from um, heroin, fentanyl, and other opioids, for example. Mm -hmm. The intention was good. It just seems to be maybe abused at times, would you say? Right. It's the nature of intent. Mm hmm uh, what one uh, tries to do with investigative tools. Each mm -hmm. agency, of course, has these these things. Some are extremely sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, FBI's investigational data warehouse has uh, billions of records, uh, phone records, um, uh, video. Um, it's a collection of about 30 other agencies, uh, indices, and their databases all under one roof called the Investigational Data Warehouse mm -hmm. so that uh, FBI can call up a screen in which around the edges are 30 different agencies feedback on any single individual. Uh, that's, that's very, very powerful. Yeah. And, and while it could be abused and is likely to be abused, it's also um, uh, strongly helpful uh, to protect American lives. Yeah or lives around the world from an extremely um, dangerous organization. Yeah. Speaking of, now let's go to an issue that's having a devastating impact on American society. Um, you were among the first to notice issues with the lethality of fentanyl in the late 1990s, just as OxyContin was beginning to be marketed as a revolutionary addiction-free pain reliever. Can you speak about what you saw both in the data and in your personal experience that led you to foresee the problems with certain synthetic opioids like fentanyl? Well, uh, my, uh, my uh, role at uh, the, the Kennedy School of Government, um, the same school that uh, Rick uh, Doblin uh, was attending, mm -hmm. uh, we had the same uh, mentor, uh, Mark Kleiman, a leading uh, drug policy analyst, uh, former DOJ employee, who was instrumental in helping to helping Rick design maps uh, and very supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful scholar and uh, friend. Um, my role um, was to <clears throat> anticipate the next major uh, drug of abuse. And by that, I mean dangerous drugs. Um, in 96, uh, fentanyl was um, relatively unknown as anesthetic. Uh, was not yet a household word, mm -hmm. um, but because of the um, ease of synthesis, relative ease of synthesis, uh, and the, ubiqu the ubiquity of the precursors worldwide, I felt it was a, um, a situation that would uh, inevitably occur that some unscrupulous uh, underground manufacturer that cared not for the lo loss of lives would make this material and that fell on deaf ears. I promoted it around Harvard and actually had the same, the, uh, the overheads from those lectures I presented at trial in 2003, uh, <clears throat> where it also fell on deaf ears uh, during a public federal trial. But then about uh, 12 years later, I'm sitting in prison and uh, began to see these reports on television of fentanyl deaths, a few here, a few there, and then a thousand, and then 10,000, and then a hundred thousand. The, the genie was out of the bottle. And even through this date, it, those figures continue and it's proliferating around the world. And frankly, I, I have no idea how to get the genie back in the bottle. I have no policy suggestions for controlling it other than 
uh, some sort of immunization against opioid use. Yeah, well, that was going to be my next question. What is the proper response to this? This seems like a problem that is absolutely out of control. The pandemic has made it has exacerbated this issue. Um, what what can the U.S. do to stop this? Well, so that's a, a very big question. I'm not sure that anyone <laughs> has answered it or can answer it. Uh, Keith Jeffries, a uh, distinguished researcher down at Stanford, a psychologist, uh, wrote a, uh, a fine article in Foreign Affairs about two years ago on fentanyl. And he, you know, predicted it would uh, simply continue to proliferate until it saturated uh, the susceptible population to opioids around the world. And indeed, it's heading in that direction. Um, the difficulty is that um, in, in the um, 90s, there were maybe eight syntheses that could possibly use to make fentanyl. Now there are 40 or 50 different approaches. And with the internet, um, these are proliferated widely. Uh, sim simplified procedures are, are available. So um, people with no training um, and no ethics, no morality uh, can make um, very large quantities. And, and indeed, that's, we see that happening every day. Yeah. You know, I recently, it's I almost... recently spoke at uh, Cooper Union. Uh, you, you were there and uh, mm -hmm. uh, put a slide up on the screen, which is very touching of a, a couple, a young couple, uh, dead in the front seat of a car from a fentanyl overdose while their six-year-old uh, looked on very concerned from the back seat. So this is a very real yeah. thing when it kills babies from just contact with a baggie with a white powder in it. Uh, I get emails from people who have lost their wives. Um, yeah. it's, it's, I know. Historically, I know a person that lost two friends recently from from fentanyl, and they were very casual recreational drug users. They you were at a party and um, wanted to have a good time, didn't know they were taking fentanyl, and they were the first two people to uh, to try it, and they thought they were just getting a little bit of cocaine, and um, they died in the middle of the party. And you know this 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 isn't. This is an issue that's per pervasive in all parts of our society, and um, it's a, an absolute crisis that our government is not really addressing very well. Um, and you've highlighted the fact that part of probably the reason why it's not being addressed well is because it's a very difficult problem to control. And um, exactly, like yeah. exactly, Melissa. I, one of the difficulties we're seeing is that. Um, um, distributors are mixing it with uh, every known substance, not just fake oxycodones, but uh, cocaine for, you know, quasi speedballs to um, presumed uh, hallucinogenics, uh, uh, anything to produce a subjective experience. Um, and the user often has no idea what they're dealing with, but um, right. right. So uh, that's the issue. So now it seems the DEA is being reactive to this issue. Um, but we all know if you ban one drug, a worse drug takes its place. And now the DEA is set to schedule five tryptamine psychedelics in the next few months. Um, in spite of fentanyl epidemic, the DEA seems undeterred from its policy of scheduling psychoactive, psychoactive substances by default. How can um, the psychedelic movement better organized to push back against the scheduling by default? Well, it's just a personal view of matters, but um, I do feel that um, from, <clears throat> from what I can see, the, the presence of, of psychedelics or the avail heightened availability of them, the classical psychedelics with no lethality, <clears throat> as even uh, DEA will admit, non-addictive, no th lethality, um, seem to be <clears throat> helpful in displacing or substituting for, for opioids. In other words, uh, there's an inverse relationship between um, psychedelic availability and, 
and opioid uh, uh, incidents or deaths. So uh, the, the wiser policy might be to be somewhat uh, softer on psychedelics, uh, uh, with the rationale being that uh, it would be helpful for opioid use disorder. Um, you're right. Um, <clears throat> DEA has just uh, recently proposed scheduling uh, DIPT, which is a hallucinogen that seems to work selectively on uh, audition or hearing. Um, well, there are no other effects, but just on hearing. That was one of Sasha Shogun's um, more curious and favorite uh, intriguing compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <clears throat> and DEA will have its hands full in the next three to four years because there will be literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of new analogs. And some of these Psychedelic or otherwise? Psychedelic analogs. Mm -hmm. Because of the, in, the intensity with which they're being created by the many corporations that are new. Right. So we will see um, some possibly great healing medicines. Mm -hmm. And we'll see little disasters occur as well. So, so it's going, you... to be, going to be a wild ride the next <laughs> So do you think the private sector and the research community continuing to pursue um, this quest for research in psychedelic medicine, do you think that is going to soften DEA's view on this eventually? They seem to be pretty staunchly in their culture of being a drug enforcement agency when they're also a, a drug regulatory agency. But, you know, one would argue they don't really see themselves as a regulatory agency. But this what's happening with psychedelic medicine seems like it could be the thing that shifts the DEA. Well, shifting the DEA would be a tall order. Uh, mm -hmm. They are indeed an enforcement agency and uh, quite serious about things, <clears throat> as I've learned over the years. Um, they're going to have their hands full, uh, not only in regulatory basis, uh, but an enforcement basis, uh, not only with fentanyl and the many, many new analogs that continue to come out of China. There's no limit to fentanyl analogs, basically. There are thousands of them. Yeah. Um, with the psychedelics, uh, it's a revolution, uh, Melissa, a revolution in regulatory agencies and people talking about the potential curative properties. Um, and DEA is not entirely deaf to the public conversation. Um, I'm sure they are um, pondering what to do or how to respond uh, to the <laughs> hundreds of corporations rather busily and well-funded uh, uh, producing uh, new materials. Yeah. Uh, I, right. I suspect uh, they, they are in a position of let's uh, wait and see. <clears throat> so the, um, the proposal to um, control DIPT and uh, related analogs was surprising to me to see that come on in the current climate. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I have not not investigated the reasons for that. It may be that they've come across some aspects of DIPT abuse, or maybe they've come through some emergency scene room records or deaths from it, mm -hmm. or not. It would be um, of great interest uh, to me personally and to our listeners to, uh, to investigate why the proposal. In terms of what to do about it, I would suggest that uh, those with... Um, those established academics researching in the field uh, write letters expressing their ideas uh, during the period in which the public can respond to DEA's proposed schedule. That's mm -hmm. routine. If mm -hmm. people sit on their hands and don't write in, uh, it will be scheduled. Right. It's important that <clears throat> the research community, particularly the research community, established uh, academicians, um, respond to every open period of scheduling mm -hmm. so that uh, these precious compounds uh, are not put into the dark ages that their relatives have been the last 30 years. Do you think the research community is willing to put themselves out there like that to do that? 
Well, if you were if a researcher, say if you were, um, you know, in New Haven or Baltimore uh, or Madison and uh, are established researcher with a license, mm -hmm. um, you might uh, fear that uh, making a positive public statement uh, might uh, yield that license back to right. those that gave it. But um, I think that a, a balanced um, statement um, uh, to DEA, uh, balanced with references, um, a sober uh, assessment of the pros and cons of um, making the substance le illegal, right, um, would not be viewed uh, negatively. Right. Yeah. So that sense of community has to be there, and that effort has to be a collective effort. Um, we can't just leave it to the researchers to push back against the DEA. We all need to get behind an effort like that and come together and be organized and cohesive. Um, and I think that that is what is going to slowly push our government institutions to adapt to this. Um, I, I, would agree, I would agree with you, Melissa. You know, uh, what the work that you're doing at Psychedelic Medicine uh, Coalition uh, and the work of, uh, of many people, uh, activists across the United States with uh, decriminalization movements are, are a phenomenon that I <clears throat> never anticipated. And uh, you know that during uh, the last 30, 40, 50 years, uh, it was a period of quietness. Mm -hmm. you know, after the, the hearings that uh, made LSD illegal in uh, 66, um, a period of uh, quietitude settled over the community and mm -hmm. people were afraid to speak out, afraid to say anything. They were considered fringe, marginalized. Uh, one's career was at stake if one voiced uh, any favorable opinion to this class of compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, all that has changed. It's just a stunning, stunning uh, revolution in public perception. Um, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, well, I anticipate that it will last. It may be too big to fail, as they say. <laughs> I, I suspect there'll be some media, um, you know, flaming the embers of uh, negative clinical trials or uh, you know, unusual events or behavioral acting out. Uh, will probably seize the press's attention. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, but uh, you know, mainstream media seems to be somewhat getting behind this. So we've had, you know, the work that MAPS has done on CBS Sunday morning, um, today's show, uh, Good Housekeeping has done uh, articles about psilocybin therapy. Uh, it seems to be catching on and, you know, and a lot of the positive reception is based on the research that's been coming out. Absolutely. You know, once uh, Roland uh, Griffiths at uh, Hopkins in uh, 2015 announced in the Journal of Psychopharmacology with about eight refereed uh, distinguished researchers behind him, you know, the uh, the ball was rolling. So <laughs> the last uh, six years has been uh, quite a remarkable evolution of matters. Absolutely. But just remember, uh, these drugs are still are seriously illegal. Mm-hmm. And uh, the suffering that went on before this uh, this current enlightenment was uh, unspeakable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I have great hope for the future. Well, perfect. That takes us to our last question. What does the psychedelic landscape of the future look like from your perspective? I was going to ask if you're hopeful for psychedelic reform. I know you are. But um, are you hopeful that psychedelic reform will overcome some of the challenges we face and the cultural barriers we have within society and our government institutions? That's a very broad question. Uh, let me see if I can <laughs> enter into that reasonably. You know, in the, in the 60s, uh, when I was in my 20s, if you can imagine that, and in the 60s, in the first uh, 10 million doses of uh, acid, uh, was deployed uh, by the Brotherhood of Eternal Love in San Francisco and spread throughout Northern California and around the world. Uh, we saw changes occur socially. 
we saw young people marching against uh, the bombing in Cambodia and Vietnam, bring the boys back home. We saw changes in art, uh, music particularly, enormous changes in music. Um, and those, those young people have all grown up those that sat around campfires in their youths and had uh, miraculous evenings. And they're, they're now uh, leaders in various industries and, and, in, and titans of corporations and leading researchers and politicians even. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, those experiences of the youth are now uh, mature and in positions of authority. And the cascade goes all the way down to um, the very young person having their, their first experience, a favorable experience. So we're, we're all in this together. Indeed. And if we keep a bright heart and keep talking with each other, we keep the faith as they say, and uh, move forward with uh, gentleness and grace and remember, as some feel these things are sacred, not not to forget that, then it will be all right. Currently, there's divisions appearing in the psychedelic community, uh, perhaps necessary divisions. The, the argument of, for example, the uh, organization Freedom to Operate by Kerry Turnbull mm -hmm. has uh, filed a perhaps a necessary a lawsuit uh, claiming uh, um, against a uh, patent held by uh, a corporation. Um, well, patents are necessary to attract big pharma ultimately to develop things. Um, um, not having a patent takes it out of the hands of big pharma and puts it in the hands of many, many smaller entities without such resources. And ultimately, that may be better in the long run. Uh, but the divisiveness should be collegial and not negative. It shouldn't be filled with, oh, this corporation, these people are bad because they have a patent. That shouldn't be the case. Uh, it should be a, a technical argument mm -hmm. because our community uh, must be infused with, dare I say it, love. There must be uh, a warmth among us. I love that. In order to be forward. <laughs> yeah. Right? We can't fight our way forward. We have to go bravely and courageously and gently and with affection toward what may come and with humility toward what will come. Thank you, Leonard. I can't think of a better way to end this interview. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and very best wishes in, in your efforts on the Hill. That's a courageous path, and uh, you're the woman on the point. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't pick the easiest path, but I like a good challenge, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly got one. Yes, I do. I know. <laughs> Any blessings, well, Melissa. Thank you so much, Leonard. Next up, welcome Psychedelic Medicine Coalition's board member and former Congressman Ryan Costello and Molly Allen, PMC's co-founder and chairwoman of the board, in conversation with Congressman Earl Blumenauer from Oregon. We want to welcome everybody to the National Psychedelic Policy Roundtable. We are very very thrilled to have two special guests with us today. The first guest, Rep. Earl Blumenauer from Oregon and also former Rep. Ryan Costello from Pennsylvania. Um, we wanted to have just a casual conversation um, with Rep. Blumenauer, knowing how important he has been in this psychedelic space. He seems to be always a leader on these issues and we're very thankful for that. So. Thank you so much for being here today, Rep. Blumenauer, and agreeing to sit and chat with us and to chat with one of your former colleagues. <laughs> Looking forward to it. 
So I think that one of the things on everyone's mind right now in terms of psychedelics is if you wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on in your home state. I mean, what's happening in Oregon is both really exciting um, and a very interesting state experiment in how to legalize the psychedelic through a very specific medical model. So we know a lot of states and stakeholders are watching how this goes. So could you comment a bit on the process and what you hope other states can learn from Oregon's approach? Sure. Well, this uh, measure uh, 101, 109, which passed in November of 2020, follows a pattern that we've had in Oregon uh, dealing with death with dignity, for example, and leadership that we've taken uh, in terms of legalizing cannabis. Uh, this ballot measure, which passed overwhelmingly, by the way, uh, is a an effort for the state to be able to uh, deal with this in a very thoughtful, scientific fashion, to be able to uh, develop a psycho, uh, psilocybin assisted care, uh, treating depression, end of life, anxiety, addiction. The research is compelling uh, and we've been spending time trying to help the public understand it. This is a very narrowly crafted step-by-step -step effort uh, to build on best practices uh, of existing research and pairs the access to psilocybin with supported sessions with trained and certified facilitators, taking it step-by-step -step in a fashion that I think will provide people with the confidence that it's being done properly. Uh, we've had uh, activists uh, from around the country looking at this approach. Given the proven impact that psilocybin therapy can have, this experiment uh, that is, I think, very thoughtful, very deliberate, ought to be something that has opportunities to be replicated around the country. I'm very excited that Oregon is going to once again be pioneering a very critical policy area. Congressman, you, you shared something that I, I found to be, um, you know, kind of at, at the tip of my tongue and a lot of people who have, have more recently um, become interested in the issue um, from a public policy perspective, and that is the data uh, and, and the results of that data, the science uh, that is out there. When you see research institutions like Johns Hopkins, NYU, um, University of California, um, can you speak a little bit about uh, sort of taking what Oregon is doing and pretending or, uh, th that we were looking at, at the federal level um, and advocating before federal policymakers with a patient-centered approach on, on the types of things that should be emphasized uh, from a data perspective and, and what some of these clinical trials are actually showing? Well, first and foremost, what we have to do is be able to get broader awareness of what has actually done. Uh, as you said, uh, the research that is out and available is pretty compelling, but it's not widely appreciated and understood. Uh, we think we have a major challenge uh, in the next two years to be able to encourage people to do the deep dive into the data and then supplement it by what we do on the ground. Uh, the Psychedelic Medicine Coalition uh, has been tremendously helpful uh, in engaging directly with my colleagues on this subject. We need to be able to encourage other members of Congress to be able to do this deep dive. Uh, there is, uh, I think, no question that there's far more interest in Congress as you remember, Ryan, from your time uh, dealing in some of these areas, people are maybe a little reluctant to be open about it, but there's great curiosity, there's great interest. And when we're dealing with uh, issues of depression and addiction, um, our results, let's just say, have been uh, not overwhelming with traditional approaches. Right. And in fact, the, uh, the over medication with uh, drugs uh, actually have had, uh, I think, rather unsettling results. Uh, looking at what happens, uh, how we've treated our veterans, for instance, um, with uh, what people think is mainstream uh, you know, medical interventions, uh, 
the results have not been positive. And I think this is an area that's much more promising. Certainly. And so to that point, Congressman, you know, it seems that up until this point, a lot of, you know, on the research subject, a lot of the research has been funded privately by either universities or reputable institutions or nonprofits. How important do you think and how far away are we from potentially, um, you know, NIH backed research grants or specific appropriations for psychedelics from the federal government? Well, we've uh, had a challenge. Uh, getting NIH to be able to deal in this space. I mean, we look at what the problems we've had just dealing with cannabis. Uh, this is an opportunity, I think, to do it right. NIH uh, is geared to doing this sort of, of research, uh, doing it on a scale that is necessary, and frankly, being able to have research that has less stigma that's attached to it. Questions are raised even in prestigious research universities. Uh, it's just not the same as the NIH. Uh, they use the term gold standard. Uh, I think at times that's overused, but the NIH is our vehicle. Um, the, the federal government actually has the most at stake. There are billions and billions of dollars every year that is spent on ineffective treatment. Um, if we're able to have a breakthrough with NIH funded research, there's a potential here for not only better outcomes based on the research that we've seen, but tremendous savings for the federal government. Uh, being able to use these therapies uh, with the Veterans Administration, uh, with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, there are hundreds of billions of dollars on the line and an opportunity to provide better therapies, safer therapies. So we're going to do our best in Oregon to blaze this path. I think we're off to a good start. But having the NIH fully involved and engaged followed, I hope, soon thereafter with the Veterans Administration will be a breakthrough that will have profound effects for the federal government's bottom line, but more important to have treatment options that are more effective for some of the most troubling conditions that afflict our citizens. Yeah, uh, so picking up on, on something that you said there, um, you know, I, I, I feel that one of the challenges in this space, and we're curious as advocates um, what your perspective on this is, one of the challenges is explaining what this is and what it isn't, because some of the critique is rooted in things that we're not even talking about or advocating for. Um, this is really about making sure that patients have a full uh, sort of menu of treatment options that science um, and experience has demonstrated work um, and every patient's different. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on, on the, the types of patient advocacy groups um, or, or those in the medical community uh, who are best situated to help us uh, with our message to, uh, in advocacy on the Hill? Well, we've made most of our progress to date coming from advocacy groups, people who are committed, who have followed the research, who have been able to be engaged uh, in ways that uh, are uh, distinct from traditional approaches. Uh, it makes a huge difference having that uh, uh, flexibility and, and freedom of analysis. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us, however, uh, because this uh, research attitudes regarding psilocybin um, are pretty uh, limited. Uh, people have are trapped in terms of uh, what they remember from the 60s. Uh, Timothy Leary and Ken yeah. Kesey and, you know, that uh, <laughs> breaking the stereotypes and looking at what has actually happened. Uh, Ryan, you referenced research work from reputable institutions. Uh, this isn't the what we've seen in the 60s and the 70s, um, although candidly, 
the history of psilocybin goes back to the federal government, the Department of Defense, uh, having been involved with a variety of experiments uh, 50 years ago. But we have an opportunity now to do this right, to be able to engage people in ways that uh, harness the potential therapeutic impacts and using the approach that we've done in Oregon, which will be supervised clinical activities, will reinforce those opportunities and I think uh, give the public uh, a view of how this should be done. Right. Yeah. I, I do want to go back a second to the appropriations because I think it was a pretty big deal that this year there was some House Appropriations Committee, subcommittee report language talking specifically about, um, you know, urging essentially the NIH to explore um, psychedelic therapies for PTSD and certain major depressive disorders. So, yeah, you know, was, I think to a lot of advocates, we saw that as a signal kind of from Congress to NIH to say that they were interested and, in, you know, Congress is interested in them pursuing these types of avenues. Do you think that, do you view that the same way? I mean, is that the first step to appropriations? We fought hard for that language. Mm -hmm. uh, NIH and other federal agencies pay close attention uh, to Congress giving instructions through the budget process uh, and having the language, the specific language, undertake research to evaluate the effectiveness of psychedelic therapies in treating PSD, major depressive disorder, and other serious medical conditions. Uh, that's pretty direct. It's uh, very clear. Uh, it will be received by the appropriate agencies. Uh, it ha carries great weight. Uh, it was a priority for us, and I was pleased that we have uh, have that in the final language. Any thoughts um, or experience with the DEA in this space? Um, you know, obviously, it's there's been a long history of cannabis, um, but now increasingly um, with with state ballot measures. Um, um, going the way they have gone uh, in this area. I'm sure that you and your office have made, been made aware of, of how DEA is perhaps being a bit more proactive in the um, scheduling space, for lack of a better term. Would, could you share any thoughts there um, as we prepare to be advocates this year? Well, I don't think they've been proactive enough. I mean, the DEA <laughs> has a very troubled history uh, with the failed war on drugs. Uh, it has been involved with billions of dollars wasted uh, in terms of interfering with what should have been reasonable policy developments and research uh, uh, overwhelmed by the enforcement aspects. Um, I was actually I just, using proactive in a not, <laughs> that was a misnomer yeah. how I used it. The point is yeah. that maybe perhaps they're being a little too, uh, they're not approaching it the way that uh, perhaps yeah. we might like to see. Yeah, uh, they've uh, they continue to schedule the uh, to list the majority of pro, uh, proactive molecules in a, being scheduled, uh, which is, you know, flies in the face of what we need to have done with our research efforts. Um, a criminal justice enforcement agency is not well equipped. They have a mindset. They have a reputation. Uh, their staff has an entirely different background and experience, and the cross pressures that they face, uh, directly and indirectly, uh, are completely contrary to what we need to have happen. I'd like to just get them out of the equation. Right. If I had my way, we would yeah. redirect resources in ways that would be much more effective and realistic. Uh, we have a wide range of things we need to be doing to be able to promote understanding, true understanding of what the properties are of, of uh, scheduled drugs, uh, being able to understand promising therapies, to be able to research them in an unbiased way, and to be able to get the results of that information out the door. Uh, that just simply isn't the mission of the DEA. Well, we certainly want to, you know, on the subject of the DEA, thank you for, um, you know, your guidance and leadership. We know that you recently 
sent a letter to Administrator Milgram asking um, specifically about access to psilocybin for terminally ill patients yeah. under the right to Absolutely. trial law. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, and along that thread, do you, uh, you know, what say, hopes do you have for... Let me just, sorry, just go ahead. clarify for a second. I mean, that is a classic example of what's wrong here. Yeah. We shouldn't yeah. have to fight to have the application of the right to try law uh, for terminally ill people for very promising therapy that could make mm -hmm. a huge difference for them. Yeah. Um, you know, just what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, we couldn't agree more. I mean, thank you for being, so, again, such a leader in that space and for sending that letter to Administrator Milgram. I was going to ask, you know, do you have, um, you know, what types of hopes do you have for her? Um, leading the DEA. I mean, it's been a while since we've had a true administrator, and it seems like so far she's been pretty quiet, um, both on the enforcement and regulatory front. I mean, they did up the psilocybin um, amounts for the year, which people saw as a good sign in terms of potentially allowing for research. Um, but other than that, they, she does seem to have been pretty quiet. I mean, you know, are you, are you expecting a lot out of her or? I don't know. I don't know. I remain open. Uh, we sent uh, the correspondence uh, to be able, for example, to have the, the right to try uh, uh, applied. Um, I've, not, I've yet to meet with her. Uh, I look forward to doing that. But we think that this is a golden opportunity for that agency to get in step with what the trends are, with the medical research with the promising therapies for areas that desperately need new and powerful approaches uh, to, to use the benefit of the research, to be able to do a reset, to not be trapped in the failed war on drug mentality. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it's going to come out. I can tell you what the trend line is. Over the course of the next 10, day, 10 years, there will be a revolution in terms of how the DEA is perceived, how it operates, uh, but that uh, the speed with which that change takes place um, is as yet unknown. The Biden administration has not interfered with a lot of the work that we've been involved with to try and modernize drug laws uh, for cannabis, other special, scheduled drugs. They haven't directly interfered with the application of innovative state laws, like what we have in Oregon with Measure 109 and the psilocybin therapy, uh, but it's not yet been proactive. Uh, I have hopes that that will change. Well, we have we have hopes for continued engagement with you, Congressman. You're a leader and a gentleman, and um, we're very grateful for um, for taking the time to speak with us and for. Just the thoughtfulness uh, with which you approach public policy in a very tumultuous political environment as it is. Well, thank you, Ryan. I, uh, I appreciate uh, your kind words. I appreciate uh, the approach that you took both as a member and with things that you're working on now. Uh, it's a troubled times in your nation's capital. Uh, things are deeply divided uh, and non-functional, but this is an area that offers the chance of bringing us together. Uh, the typical right, left, red state, blue state, Republican, Democrat doesn't have to apply here. This is an area that we can bring people together with these promising new therapies uh, that combine people across the political spectrum, not necessarily in a partisan sense, but philosophically. This is an opportunity for us to get around some of the partisan roadblocks and focus on things that will make a difference for everyday people, promising therapies that will provide relief for people who need it, uh, actually cost savings in these times that ought to be attractive, and it's a new territory. Uh, I what you're doing here with uh, your programming, uh, your outreach is an important part. The more that the public understands what we're doing in Oregon, the more the public understands the promising research that we've got, the more the public understands the growing coalition 
of people that want to do this right. Uh, it's going to really hasten the day when we make the adjustments that we need. So I thank you for this conversation. Uh, thank you for what you're doing and look forward to continuing our conversation uh, as Oregon goes along this path. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Congressman. We are so grateful for Congressman Blumenauer for joining us. Thank you. Last and certainly not least, we have Rick Doblin, a legend in the psychedelic research space. Rick Doblin is founder and executive director of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. MAPS has been the leader in the psychedelics research space since the 80s, and Rick created MAPS to research the healing potential of MDMA and other psychedelics, and has led MDMA to phase three clinical trials with the FDA. Their work is truly groundbreaking, and the studies cover a spectrum of indications, including PTSD, eating disorders, social anxiety and adults with autism, and anxiety related to terminal illness. Not only is MAPS on the forefront of research, but they are also challenging the status quo on how we are thinking about the future of the psychedelic landscape by thinking through potential issues innovatively and embedding ethical considerations in business practices. Rick, so happy to have you with us this evening. Let's jump right into it. As mentioned, your work Thank with <laughs> thanks your work with getting MDMA to phase three clinical trials is groundbreaking. Can you briefly walk us through the different steps in a drug's FDA trial and tell us more about how MAPS had to innovate their way through the process? Yeah, sure. So traditionally, what happens is there is um, a new molecule that is either discovered and patented or existing. And some people then like us want to take MDMA, which was invented in 1912 by Merck through the system. So the, the first set of things usually are um, animal studies demonstrating safety that are required by the FDA. Then once you pass that screen, there's what are called phase one studies. And those are studies in healthy volunteers, usually not patients unless it's a cancer drug or something that's got a lot of toxicity where you wouldn't have healthy volunteers start evaluating what the drug does. So, but in general, phase one dose response safety studies where you're trying to characterize the safety in humans and also trying to sort out a little bit of signals, what does the drug actually do? Now with MDMA or psilocybin or LSD, we have, you know, tens of millions of people have already drug, done these drugs. We have an enormous amount of information about them, but nevertheless, um, we still have to start in this phase one, gathering the data under um, <clears throat> regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. Then once you're reasonably certain, you being the sponsor of the research, that there is an acceptable safety profile and some signs of uh, clinical efficacy, you start doing small, pilot studies that are called phase two. And the purpose of phase two is really just to figure out <clears throat> whether you wanna spend the extra money to go larger for phase three. And then if so, how do you design phase three? What are your outcome measures? What is your patient population? What is your treatment method? Um, and all of these are iterated multiple times in different phase two studies till you get a sense of what you wanna to try to prove safety and efficacy. And that's what happens in phase three. And phase three is the final stage of research to prove safety and efficacy. And if you do that, then you can get approval for marketing for prescription use. There's also what are called phase four studies that the FDA can impose, either suggest or require after the drug is approved in order to gather data on uh, other people that have certain particular safety issues, or in our particular case, what we're required to do in phase four is studies in adolescence. If we succeed in adults with PTSD 18 with no upper age limit, then we must do 12 to 17 year olds with PTSD. 
And if that works, we must do seven to 11 year olds with PTSD. So those are phase four studies. Now, as far as um, beyond phase four is just to say that we're studying MDMA for PTSD, but MDMA is good for so many other things. As you said, end of life anxiety, social anxiety. Um, we'll see if we get good data on eating disorders. So you may, as a sponsor, do additional research after uh, phase three to prove other indications, but those wouldn't technically be called phase four studies. Those would be <clears throat> earlier in the process developing uh, <clears throat> the evidence for safety and efficacy. So you might do some small phase two and then more phase three for MDMA for eating disorders, things like that. Now, as far as innovation, um, FDA has never studied psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. You know, the closest that we would say recently we are aware of is that ketamine, S-ketamine, an isomer of ketamine became a medicine mm -hmm. for depression, but that's without any kind of therapy at all. Mm -hmm. So we've had to bring the FDA along in what is the therapeutic process? How do we standardize the therapeutic process? Um, how do we train the therapists? FDA doesn't really regulate psychotherapy. So they want to know that there's training, but they don't necessarily want to have anything to say about what the training is. They look at the outcomes, the safety and efficacy outcomes. But there's a lot of regulations that the FDA um, imposes. So to give you a very brief sense of one thing is how we've um, innovated in a sense that has made it easier for other psychedelics to go through the system. Um, from 1986, when I started MAPS to 1992, we had um, five protocols all rejected. Starting in 1992, we got the approval for the first phase one dose response safety study that took us through um, the 90s. Starting around uh, 2000, we began the work with PTSD patients in Spain and also in the United States, the effort to do that. That took us 16 years. And uh, November 29th, 2016 is when we had the what's called the end of phase two meeting, where you present your data and you say, now we want to go to phase three. We've got permission to do that. And then what we did is we negotiated for over eight months to come to agreement or to try to come to agreement on the protocol design on all the other safety data that the FDA would want to get the drug approved. And we managed to successfully complete that and get an agreement letter, which means the FDA is legally obligated to approve the drug um, if we get statistically significant evidence of efficacy and there's no new safety problems arise. That was now um, 2017 in July that that finished. And then in August, we got breakthrough therapy designation. So that was the first time FDA has ever given breakthrough to any kind of um, psychedelic. Mm -hmm. um, later, uh, Along comes Compass Pathways, working on psilocybin as in a for-profit way, USONA doing it in a non-profit way. They both ended up getting breakthrough therapy as well. But then the FDA started realizing this whole field is opening up and there's going to be a lot more research to be done. And the FDA bureaucrats got kind of scared about what happens if something goes wrong, are they going to be blamed? So then they started saying to USONA and Compass that the two-person therapy team where we had come to agreement that the lead person needs to have a license to do therapy. The second person does not need a license. They either need to be in a program to get a license or have a thousand hours behavioral health experience um, and have a bachelor's degree. That um, that was what they we've agreed to in phase uh, three. And also that we have a doctor on call. A doctor does the screening, the prescribing, but is not on site. So along comes Compass and USONA, and FDA gets nervous, as I said. So they started saying that the lead person needs to be an MD or a PhD, and that the doctor needs to be on site, not on call. And Compass and USONA tend to do work in uh, academic medical centers, which mm -hmm. we do not particularly care for. Um, you know, we have a lot of private practice sites. Uh, we have some academic sites, but uh, they agreed to this. Um, then we come along for new protocols, for one that we had with eating disorders, for example. And then FDA says to us, you need MD, PhD. You need a doctor on site. And we found it very hard to uh, disagree at that point because we wanted to get those studies started and it's a new patient population. Then we have a protocol December, 2019, which was following up on an earlier protocol 
it's a healthy volunteers who are therapists in our training program to give them MDMA. And FDA comes along and says, we want the lead person to be MD, PhD, and the doctor on site, and we're never going to give you permission for this anyway. It's too risky. Don't use, don't think you can give psychedelics to therapists as part of their training. We're not going to permit this. And they put a clinical hold on the study, even though we'd had already 80 people before go through a similar protocol with no problem. Um, so then um, we sort of shared information to the FDA on our phase three data, comparing the sites that had MD-PhD with the sites that didn't in their therapy team and the results looked at efficacy were very similar. Then also um, we looked at where there was a doctor on site, where there was not a doctor on site, the safety information was similar. And we did a survey of all the people that had been in the protocol before, how important it was to them, what their benefits were professionally to treat patients personally. And the FDA ignored it completely. Yeah. And they kept saying, no, they never responded to the substance of what we were saying. And so what we then did is realize with our consultants and lawyers that we needed to engage in what's called a formal dispute resolution process, which cost us over a quarter million dollars in legal fees. Wow. And in the end, we um, appealed to the higher levels at the FDA over the Office of Neuroscience over the Division of Psychiatry, and we won completely. So knocked out MD-PhD, which was a poison pill for the entire industry, because if the person needs to be MD-PhD, they're more expensive, they're more credentialed, but they're in no way necessarily better therapists. Right. I mean, PhD psychologists often don't do therapy. They do assessments and things. MDs, they hardly get any training. Even if you're a psychiatrist, you can hardly get any training for therapy. Mm -hmm. And if you need to have a doctor on site, then that knocks out all these small private practice sites. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, winning completely. And that we turned it back to what it was in phase three. Then, um, a couple of weeks ago, I got this contact from uh, the people at Hopkins saying that they had got this message back from FDA about a new project they wanted to do that said they needed MD PhD, but it said they could have a, a, a master's of social work as well. And they wondered how they should respond. So wow. I said, well, first off, it's good that they gave you this master's level person. So that means that we did knock this out, not just for us, but for others, but there's no reason to limit it just to masters of social work. You know, it should be all different kinds of people that are licensed to do therapy. So that I said, you should fight back. So they did do that. And then the FDA gave them permission, including even for psychiatric nurses to be the lead therapist. So they've gone down from MD, PhD to psychiatric nurses. Wow. Not gone down in quality necessarily, right. but gone down in their requirements. So mm -hmm. that's just one example of innovating, of struggling with the FDA to try to create a um, reasonable set of credentials for the people to go forward. You know, the other things, that, you know, we've innovated is first off the protocol to give therapists their own experience with MDMA, mm -hmm. how we designed our training program to train therapists. Um, actually then, you know, what is our therapeutic method, uh, the overnight stays, all this. So there's all sorts of innovations along the whole, whole road and it, whatever, um, progress we make is now applying to the whole field. Right. That's amazing. So what, since all this innovation is kind of happening in real time, at least within the last 10 years, 20 years, um, what do you think, which psychedelics do you think is our next in the queue? We know psilocybin is in a clinical trial as well. Um, but a lot of this is surrounding around mental health indications. Uh, what do you think is next beyond that? Well, um, we're anticipating that MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD is likely to be approved by the FDA before the end of 2023. Mm -hmm. We think psilocybin is a year or two after that, psilocybin for depression. There's early work being done with 5-MeO-DMT for depression. Mm -hmm. There's very early work. People are interested in mescaline. Different groups are interested in um, LSD. Um, there's going to be, um, basically what we're talking about is psychedelic medicine and the practice of psychedelic medicine 
the same way the practice of psychiatry, they have multiple different antidepressants, antipsychotics, they have all these different tools in the tool chest, medicines. Psychedelic medicine is going to be like that. And the therapists are going to be one of the trained in MDMA, ketamine, psilocybin, 5-MeO, DMT, LSD, mescaline, you know, ayahuasca, ibogaine, all, all these things. So I think that there's going to um, be ever more research into all these other substances. Then I'd say one of the other um, areas that I'm not that enthusiastic about, but is interesting, is people are trying to develop shorter acting psychedelics. Uh -huh. This idea that, oh, we can do, uh, now 5-MeO-DMT is only like 20 minutes or something uh -huh. like that. Um, but the idea is how do we fit the psychedelics into the existing model of therapy with shorter hours? Or, you know, how do we make it more um, efficient or effective if they can if somehow other shorter is better? We, we personally think a lot of times longer is better. Right. But there will be those molecules. And in particular, those new molecules will be patentable. And that's mm -hmm. what people are going to be looking to do. So there's going to be... Um, I think a flourishing of research, assuming um, we can get approved, but even more important than the approval is going to be the insurance coverage. Right. Can we get it so that this is really accessible, not just to people who are self-paid? You know, how do we really scale it to the people that need it the most? Uh, many of whom don't have the resources unless they have insurance. Right. Right. It's a big issue coming up for the movement. Yeah. Thank you for that summary, the FDA. I think that. There is a lot of confusion about how the process goes and what it looks like. And as we can see, it's a very long and arduous process, and it takes yes. a lot of time and patience and a lot of challenging our federal government to think differently about these things because they're different kinds of medicine. So thank you for that summary. Um, we're going to jump now to the DEA. In spite of the gains that advocates of psychedelics have made in the last decade or so, the DEA continues to schedule the majority of psychoactive molecules discovered. Uh, most recently, there have been five more tryptamine psychedelics set to be scheduled within the next few months. What barriers are put in place of research when a psychedelic compound is scheduled, especially when it's scheduled soon after its discovery? And how can we push back against this de uh, default policy of federal scheduling immediately um, the, the DEA has adopted since psychedelics have been um, prohibited? Well, you know, the way to push back is when DEA announces that they are going to schedule something, that there's a 30-day public comment period and you can apply for a hearing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what we did in, in 84 in the nonprofit before MAPS. Um, we have these DEA administrative law judge hearings. Those are expensive. They require major lawyers. They take time. There has to be the evidence. It's kind of hard to say that there's um, evidence of um, safety and or efficacy or something different than the scare stories you may hear from DEA for new molecules for which there's no history. Um, <clears throat> but gets to your first question about what are the complications once something is scheduled. So if it's unscheduled, you don't, it's, if it's legal, you don't even need the FDA. Mm -hmm. You don't need the DEA. You can do your research. As long as you're doing work in humans, you do new, need what's called the um, you know, ethics committee or institutional review boards, you know, looking at the rights of the subjects in the study. But you don't need to go through FDA. You, you only need to go through FDA if you want to make something into a medicine. Or for us, if it's a scheduled drug, then the only way to get permission to work with it is in an FDA approved protocol. And then you get DEA licenses for your researchers. Mm -hmm. But if you are working with an unscheduled drug, you can start research right away. The data won't be considered by the FDA for approving it as a medicine because it wasn't conducted under a uh, FDA protocol, but at the same time, you can get a lot of this early information that I said about uh, safety, about what it might be good for. A lot of the phase one, phase two stuff can be done outside of FDA with um, institutional review by approval. So scheduling makes it um, much more difficult, much more expensive, much slower, lots of interactions with regulatory agencies. The DEA is very concerned about uh, tracking where controlled substances are. So you have more expenses in um, 
how you store the drug, how you alarm to the police, all, all the tracking of the drug. So I'd say it's um, a fundamental shift to uh, move research forward from a non-scheduled drug to a scheduled drug. Mm -hmm. um, just as a comment, um, Ibogaine is in Schedule 1, so it's the most highly controlled drug. But there's no evidence whatsoever that Ibogaine is a drug of abuse. It's a very difficult experience. It lasts a long time. Um, there, there's really, over the last 50 years or something, there's been virtually no stories about people abusing, quote, Ibogaine, and yet it's in Schedule 1. So I think of all the drugs that are currently scheduled, Ibogaine is the one that has the best chance of getting descheduled completely because it's also used for opiate addiction to withdraw from opiates or to help people deal with opiate addiction, other kinds of addiction, methamphetamine as well. And that's a national crisis last year with um, mm -hmm. over um, 100, you know, 1,000 people dying. Um, so I think that if we were to consider trying to deschedule anything, it would be Ibogaine. Deschedule it completely. Yeah, it's it's legal in Canada. It's legal in Mexico. It's legal in the in England. It's legal in much of Europe. The U.S. is one of the few countries where Ibogaine is criminalized. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that similar methodology that you MAPS has taken with the FDA is just like slowly chipping away at these culturally held beliefs that are just like mm -hmm. institutionalized almost in some of our federal agencies? You think that's, you know, you think this pressure is going to come to a point soon to get them to, you know, adapt to what's happening <laughs> in our culture? Well, um, I, I would say, um, no, I don't see any um, adaptation taking place anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see how to stop the way in which um, DEA will automatically schedule stuff once they hear about it. Um, I think... What's happening on the um, city and state level about uh, making mushrooms the lowest enforcement priority or decriminalizing psychedelics or decriminalizing all drugs, those are the, the kind of checks on the over-criminalization that the DEA might do by creating all, all these other models. And then the other part is um, creating educational opportunities for people who have been fed a story that, you know, MDMA causes holes in your brain and LSD hurts right. your chromosomes and stuff. So we need the medicalization the same way with medical marijuana, mm -hmm. that we had medical marijuana, it changed people's attitudes, then we could move towards legalization. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're going to really need is um, us to succeed, other people to succeed and to eventually have thousands of psychedelic clinics mm -hmm. in the, um, United States and 10,000 plus more, you know, around the world that these will create, uh, well, our goal <clears throat> actually is to have a million MDMA sessions in this decade with mm -hmm. roughly half a million patients with roughly 25,000 therapists trained by the end of the decade. And so if you can imagine that many people having almost all of them, we think will have positive healing experiences. Not everybody gets scared. Mm -hmm. um, some people might have, um, might even get worse. It doesn't work for everybody. But if you have all those people out there telling their families, their friends, you know, what they gain, that's going to be how cultural change really happens. So I guess to your very first point, yeah, it's going to be slow and incremental and it's going to take us a while longer. And multiple different approaches to kind of tackle yeah. this problem. Thank you for that. Now we're going to shift to a topic that many in the movement are concerned with. Uh, many for-profit companies are getting venture capital funding on the promise of creating a novel or designer psychedelic molecule, or at least patenting the steps of the therapeutic process. What, in your view, should be the goal of designing these mo molecules? And does our current system, both patent law and federal drug scheduling, create any perverse incentives for drug developers? Well, <clears throat> the perverse incentives are this idea that if, if you patent a new molecule, mm -hmm. then, um, and I think that it just has to be a new composition of matter. It has to be a new molecule. You've invented it. Nobody's done it before. 
you can patent it. And I think that's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's completely justified. Mm -hmm. You know, what we have is the then sense that um, only this particular company can end up doing marketing of that drug. So mm -hmm. maybe they're um, not capable of doing the research or they think that they are, but they're really not. So, you know, you've invented something, you've got the only um, right to turn it into a medicine. The, the perverse incentives are traditional, not to psychedelics, but in pharma, where a lot of times these, you know, patents are used to try to block other people from doing things. So there's not just composition of matter patents, but there's process patents, manufacturing patents, use patents. And often those are a company strategy to try to patent every use of something they can imagine. And then even if they got no data, no capacity to even do it, and then to extract money from anybody who else who wants to try to do that, who maybe can do it even better. So it's just the patent system itself has these perverse incentives that sometimes people use the patent system to try to block other people from things that um, may not be um, really even covered by the patent. You know, mm -hmm. But a lot of times they say whoever's got the most money for the patent attorneys is the one that wins the patent fights. It's not always based on the merits of the case. So there are a lot of perverse. But, but I should say that fundamentally, um, I'm sympathetic with people developing new molecules and going ahead and patenting them if they want to. I mean, as long as it's a new invention, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the problem, not really the problem, but the the issue that most people have with this system is kind of like that extractive profit motive um, that the, some of these companies have and or potentially will have. Um, MAPS has chosen to have a public benefit corporation model for its for-profit entity. Can you explain why you made that choice and what advantages it gives you over a more traditional corporate model? Yeah. Well, let's just take on capitalism uh, <laughs> by itself just for a moment. <laughs> um, you know, the unbridled pursuit of profits at the expense of anything else has poisoned the planet, has... Um, created fundamental challenges to the survival of many, many species, including our own, um, you know, externalities of, of, you know, pollution, different kinds of things that you might <clears throat> have involved in your production process that you offload into the commons, don't get factored into your price, but the society as a general pays that price. And so there's this idea that if we look at healthcare in America, where it's motivated by the profit motive. We have the highest per capita expenditures of any country in the world, but our outcomes are down like 40 or 50 of the countries because we have so many people under underinsured or uninsured. And we have so many middlemen taking out money from the insurance industries and people try to block you from getting your benefits if it's only necessary. So the whole system of um, healthcare, I think, if we look at most countries of the world, there's national health insurance, it's more equitable and, and better outcomes in general than we have in the U.S. Yeah. So I think what we've got to really think about is the, the public benefit modification of capitalism says that you maximize public benefit, not profit. And if you take on minority shareholders, they can't sue you for not maximizing profit because you have other agendas. So right. what we wanted to do was innovate both in what we do with um, making psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, making MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD a, a, a medicine, but we also wanted to innovate in how we deliver that so, for example, let's say we want to do a lot of work in refugee camps or in um, Somaliland or South Africa or Rwanda or places, Palestine, the places where there's a lot of trauma, with, mm -hmm. but not a lot of money. You know, in a traditional profit maximizing company, if you spend a lot of time, the management team spending resources trying to treat people for whom there's no benefit to you in terms of cash back, you know, humanitarian benefits. Right. There, there could be a, a shareholder revolt. 
to mm -hmm. say, don't do that. You know, how does that help my dividends? You know, who cares about this public benefit beyond its profit maximizing? So I think we felt that the public benefit corporation framework gives us a better ability to um, pursue our ethical values as we move into a profit-making adventure, which is the sale of a drug by prescription. And the fact that the for-profit entity is owned by the nonprofit, it also means that whatever profits are made will be used in furtherance of the mission of the nonprofit. It sounds awesome. It sounds like a system that can really work for a lot of these companies. Um, I think it can. I think it can. And I think um, a lot of companies, uh, not a whole lot. I mean, there's thousands of these public benefit corporations. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. think we're going to get any of the big pharma companies to change their structure. But, you know, on the margins, they might be impacted by some of the policies that we have or how. Just to say one thing about the patient assistance program, you see on TV mm -hmm. all these ads to consumers about if you can't afford the medicine, you know, contact us and we can give it to right. you at a discount or free or something like that. With psychedelic assisted therapy, the treatment is not just the medicine, it's the medicine plus therapy. Right. So if we give medicine to people at low cost or no cost, unless they can afford the therapy component, it doesn't do them any good. Mm -hmm. So that's where we may need a larger um, portion of the income going to patient assistance programs if we really want to help a bunch of patients. Now, that also means that we may want to charge higher prices for people that have insurance where they still just pay the copays. Mm -hmm. But then with that extra funds, we use that to fund even more people that are underinsured or uninsured through a patient assistance program. Right. So those are the kind of trade-offs that, that will be made. And I think doing this in a public benefit context, it, it also responds to the fact that fundamentally, I'd say the human species is um, an experiment that may or may not succeed. And right. we are... Have, we have a lot of self-destructive mechanisms in our psyches and in our actions. And yeah. so I think this public benefit, psychedelics can play a role in really helping people address the sense of separateness from others and from nature, the uh, desperation that people feel, the ability to otherize and to then discriminate and genocide and prejudice. So that I think this public benefit method really, and, and I'll say this, something you'll appreciate um, which is what's the role of legalization, you know, in what we're doing. So our view is that we have a parallel path. Our goal is mass mental health. Mm -hmm. It's not treating people with PTSD. That's part of the move towards mass mental health. But in general, um, you know, people are, are not as put together <laughs> solidly <laughs> mentally as they should as a whole. So what we feel is that we have this parallel path, drug policy, reform to make it legal for people to have these substances and drug development under a lot of regulatory controls, hopefully covered by insurance. And some people have said, well, when you make it so that you can um, buy MDMA, let's say for $10, you know, is that going to undercut the market for selling it by prescription? And so we, we had a person last night that we're talking to about uh, becoming our head of commercialization. Mm -hmm. And what um, one of his questions was exactly this. And so the response was our larger public benefit mission and our larger nonprofit mission, this mass mental health means that we will pursue legalization efforts regardless of whether they hurt the sales of prescription MDMA. You know, my view is that actually it'll help sales, that it's mm -hmm. not a threat to the business model, that it's something that you get more people comfortable to it. A lot of people will do self healing. They'll, we'll teach them about peer support, things like that. But I think it will create even, it will destigmatize the whole thing. It will create even more interest for people to go to trained professionals who can say, ah, oh, let's start with MDMA. Then let's move to psilocybin. Let's try ketamine. Let's try five MDMA. You know, then, experimenting on your own, but, but we want to facilitate people having these experiences either for medical or for recreational or spiritual purposes without having to have permission from a doctor or be part of a church 
and that that's a core value. And so when we say that that's combined with our public benefit um, corporation, it's clear that we're saying that maximizing profit at of prescription sales is not our um, approach. It's really this bigger approach of mass mental health, which requires on a moral level, um, and even from a policy level, how disastrous criminalization and prohibition is. It requires moving towards legalization simultaneously with moving towards medical use, not one and then the other. Yeah, yeah. So aside from having that like official corporate structure, which seems to be a model that can work for many, not just MDMA and psilocybin, many different psychedelics. I think this is something that anyone interested in starting something like this up could definitely adopt. Are there other ways that we could safeguard uh, psychedelics from the, the pitfalls of profit chasing? Well, I think um, to all your listeners here, um, you know, donations to the nonprofits. I think the right. nonprofits will keep the for-profits in check. If there's only one right. source of psilocybin and it's a for-profit company, mm-hmm. where are they going to set the price? How are they going right. to do it? But if there's a nonprofit in the same space that's trying to do it in a different way, they'll keep the for-profits in check to some degree. Right. So right. I think that's really important, what, what people can do that way. And the other is um, this whole, again, drug legalization. If there's alternatives that people have to, you know, exploitative prices or psychedelic clinics, then that'll be a moderating force as well. Yeah. It seems to be all about access. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. So going into our last segment here, the rate of change in the psychedelic space over the last decade has been astounding and considering 40 years of prohibition prior to that. Do you think that this pace of change is sustainable and what can we do to maintain the awareness we need to advocate for these medicines as the science and the public consciousness evolves? Well, first off, I'll say that the, um, for people looking now, right, there's a massive rate of change and there's all these new decrim efforts and 400 plus for-profit psychedelic companies and more research at the FDA and all over the world. Um, but I wouldn't say that, that the rate of, the rate of change is kind of has been this exponential curve. It's been extremely slow for like Mm -hmm. 30 or 40 of the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only really picked up in the last three, four years, basically after, um, we got permission to go to phase three Mm -hmm. and then, um, last year when we published our first phase three results. And so actually this is a good opportunity for me to say this. It's just shockingly good is that um, the journal science, science and nature are considered to be the two preeminent scientific journals in the world. Mm -hmm. And at the end of every year, science puts out a list of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs in the world. And when they put out their list for 2021, which was just about a month ago, um, protein folding as figured out by artificial intelligence was number one. And they had nine runners up. And one of the runners up was MAPS, was our MDMA PTSD research as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the world. Yeah. It just was shocking to to see that. And so (laughs) those are the kind of things that then motivate all sorts of others, many motivated by profit, Mm -hmm. and not just by this healing the world and mass mental health. But I think that the rate of change we're going to see over the next couple of years um, is going to, in a way, accelerate even faster. And by that, I mean um, the proliferation of research, but also this move into prescription use Mm -hmm. and then um, building out thousands and thousands of thousands of psychedelic clinics. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we will see an acceleration of it. I think what we can do to make that more likely Um, is this exactly what you and I are doing right now. It's this public education. We need to really prepare people because the the drug war and the drug warriors and the National Institute on Drug Abuse and others have filled people with so much misinformation about how damaging these drugs are. You you, you see now there's even more efforts about how to say that uh, marijuana is terrible in all these different ways. You know, Mm -hmm. there's just this, you know, to the point of suggesting it be re- um, prohibited and that it's too dangerous to have it even legal. And so there's this is kind of um, 
vast reservoir of fear-based misinformation mm -hmm. that people have. And so we need to drain the reservoir, replace it with accurate and honest information. And so I think people need to just get educated, go to the source documents, um, yeah. read yeah. and listen um, and prepare people. And, but, but the other part of it is for us too, is cultural symbols. So in the sixties, it was, you know, cultural, countercultural people using LSD, protesting Vietnam and other things and being seen as a threat and being squashed. Mm -hmm. And so our, our strategy of working with the VA or, or the veterans administration, getting bipartisan support for the work we're doing. Um, we're trying to do work with police officers, with firefighters, with, uh, healthcare workers that have PTSD. Mm -hmm. So it's this effort to try to, sh to move out the people who we're helping from, oh, counterculture hippies mm -hmm. to mainstream. And so yeah. that's also part of this uh, public education effort. Absolutely. And I think that's why the DC decrim campaign was so successful. I don't think a, a working mother of two had ever come out and said, admitted to using psychedelics. And it was very disarming for people. You know, they were trying to find holes in my personal experience and they couldn't, you know, I was simply a, a person desperate for a solution to my mental health issues. And I was willing to do anything I had to do to save my life and including breaking the law. So I think the public education is super critical to getting this to the next level and you know, that alone and getting the public on board with the, the idea of having psychedelic therapy as an option is going to push our government to act. So hopefully it'll happen sooner rather than later. And, you know, we can get psychedelic therapy um, accessible to people that need it because a lot of us are hurting right now and yeah. um, we could use some solutions that work. So as we're going to, we're going to close out. Uh, this discussion. Thank you so much. I've got one more question for you. Um, the psychedelic community is extremely passionate. Sometimes this passion creates infighting that distracts us from our end goals. How can we get advocates on the same page and remind everyone of our collective goals and create solidarity for this movement? Well, I mean, what we talk about, the core element of the sort of classic psychedelics is this feeling of unity beyond you know, our specific ego, our specific race, gender, nationality, religion, all of that. And so I would say that um, people in the psychedelic community need to take a bunch of psychedelics <laughs> <laughs> and, and have these kind of experiences that help them realize our commonalities. And to now the other thing, this is um, Ethan Nadelman, who used to be the head of uh, the Drug Policy Alliance, um, mm -hmm. had this comment one time, uh, quite a few years ago, actually, when uh, marijuana was just uh, moving forward with medical marijuana and, uh, and early moves towards legalization. And so what he said is that it, in, there's a pattern in social change groups, regardless of the cause that they're working towards, mm -hmm. that when it looks like there's no hope or when it's in the very early stages, you're, you're just doing it because it seems the right thing, but not enough people are listening. Everybody's working together because you have to, you're facing such incredible opposition. Once you start getting early signs of success, then people start infighting. Because now you're saying, oh, where's my piece of this puzzle? Where do I capture this? Where, so that, and he said that in many of those cases, that's where the movements fail, yeah. that they can't get past the infighting. And if you can get past the infighting, then you're unified at a higher level to move into the final stages of social change. Yeah. So I think that where we are in this um, stage, what we're trying to do is what we're calling open science is, mm -hmm. you know, sharing all of our information, our regulatory um, communications, educating everybody about what we're doing, this idea of um, trying to help everybody move forward. So I think what we need to do is um, really just remind people while we're, why we we're doing this, but also, People do need their own individual uh, support systems. So fighting for where your niche is, you know, and, and where you might have a, a job or a role or a career or, you know, which organizations carve out which things. Those are important to do, but not in this kind of way where you're just so consumed by this inner struggles that you lose track of what the real goals are. Yeah. 
So I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think it's a good point in a way to end this discussion on is, mm -hmm. you know, is this going to be a movement that is doomed by too much infighting? Yeah. Or will we rise above because of our psychedelic experiences yeah. to do that? Yeah. So I'm very hopeful that we will. And I think that this, um, there's enough good um, nonprofit actors in the space yeah. that we will, I believe, um, find more common ground and, and make yeah. it past. And because the need is so great, the drugs yeah. really work. They've worked for thousands of years. Yeah. You know, even new ones, new molecules, they're similar you know, to the existing ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we'll get past, uh, and in many cases are past this infighting, infighting phase. Yeah. But again, this is the concern. If you, you have 400 for-profit company and they're all going to try to patent stuff and start suing each other for who's doing what, mm -hmm. that's going to be a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're hopeful. I'm hopeful too. I think um, all of us, you know, one thing that I have since con conferences have started back up again, um, you know, we're hearing from different actors in the space and CEOs is um, it seems like everyone has a personal connection to this, um, you know, either through their own mental health struggles or they've watched somebody else go through a mental health struggle and, you know, in, in one way or another psychedelics helped them or their family member or their friend. And, um, people are really personally invested in this movement progressing and being successful. So I'm hoping that alone will carry us to the finish line and um, change our world. So thank you, Rick. Yeah. I think that um, this was really informative and I hope that the viewers learned something new tonight. So thank you. Yeah. And I guess I'd encourage people to check out maps.org and the we're trying to have monthly donors if people want to become monthly donors. That's a big sustaining point for us. And so um, thank you for this opportunity, Melissa. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Rick. Okay. Thanks again to Rick Dablin from MAPS for being part of our first Policy Roundtable event. I'd like to thank all of our guests that joined us today. It is clear the psychedelic movement has made a lot of progress these last 10 years, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done before access to psychedelic medicine is available for Americans. Uniting researchers, practitioners, churches, indigenous groups and advocates to take a united front towards dealing with the complex policy issues psychedelics presents is the only way we can ensure the system that gets created is as equitable as possible. It is Psychedelic Medicine Coalition's goal to lead the charge here in Washington, D.C. and to provide the education our government needs to move this issue forward. Thank you all for joining us for PMC's first annual National Psychedelic Policy Roundtable event. For more information on our work, please go to psychedelicmedicinecoalition.org and sign up for our newsletter.